Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for coming out this evening. Um, TSNE Mission Works is really excited to bring you this talk. It's our fifth event in the Grassroots Speaker Series, which is a series that was created by TSNE Mission Works staff in response to the challenges that many grassroots organizations are facing um, in terms of funding, visibility, and public awareness around key social justice issues. So the series is meant to highlight the creativity, resourcefulness, and resilience of the local community organizers um, and make space for others in the local community to hear about their work um, in a time that people in social justice organizations are struggling a lot and making really important gains. Um, and we're hopeful that these events will spark conversations um, around how capacity building organizations like TSNE Mission Works can better serve and partner with grassroots social justice organizations and for all of you to become more familiar with the work of organizations working to serve our communities. A um, few notes for tonight, there's food in the back, which I hope you've all seen. Um, help yourself at any point. Um, the food is from Bon Mi, which is um, a member of the Ujima Business Alliance, where members are committed to creating good jobs, sharing ownership, and wealth, meeting local needs, and generating community benefits. Um, bathrooms are located out these doors to the right, and there's also a gender-neutral bathroom on the fourth floor. Um, and we're live streaming tonight's event, um, and we'll be taking photos. If you don't want to appear in photos, you can take a red sticker from the um, registra registration table and put it on your name tag. Um, and for those who are watching on the live stream, thank you so much for joining us. Um, if you have any questions, um, we encourage you all to hold your questions till the end. We'll have a Q&A, and for those watching on the live stream, you can type your uh, questions into the comment box, and we will read them out and have them answered. Um, and lastly, that brings me to our featured speaker. I have the honor of introducing Kevin Lam. Uh, Kevin is a queer Lao and Vietnamese American man committed to developing and supporting leadership within Asian American communities to fight for social transformation. He currently serves as the organizing director for the Asian American Resource Workshop and has also served the community and organizations including Providence Youth Student Movement, National Queer Asian Pacific Islander Alliance, and the Queer Asian Pacific Islander Alliance. <laughs> Hi everyone, can everyone hear me? Cool. Awesome, so yeah, my name is Kevin Lam. I use he or they pronouns. Um, you could go to the next slide. Um, and yeah, I'm the organizing director with the Asian American Resource Workshop. Uh, for folks who aren't familiar with um, ARW is the acronym, um, it's a pan-Asian community organization that works to really activate and engage the Asian American community in the greater Boston area through different programming initiatives, through arts and culture, through education, and through activism and organizing. Um, and so one of the programs that I coordinate is the Dorchester Organizing Training Initiative. Um, and that is a program, leadership and organizing development program, specifically to um, develop the leadership and power within the Vietnamese community based in Dorchester in the Fields Corner area. Um, and so tonight, in, we're gonna be talking, or I'm gonna be talking about Southeast Asian deportation um, and kind of what's been happening over the past year and how ARW started to come into organizing um, around this issue happening before this event. Cool, awesome. Uh, and for those who haven't, it's okay. I think um, the reason why I'm talking about Southeast Asian deportation specifically is because in my experiences um, in organizing where oftentimes when we're talking about um, immigration, but also when we're talking about like issues impacting Asian communities, issues that are impacting Asian communities, Southeast Asian communities are often left out of that conversation, right? And so for tonight, I really wanted to focus in on the Southeast Asian deportation um, uh, issue and like the experience of the Southeast Asian community. Um, and so, you know, as a Lao and Vietnamese person, I have a personal stake in this and why I'm organizing against deportation um, because of the diaspora of my people and our experiences. Um, and so, uh, just to give, again, a little bit of intro context of who I am, a lot of it's already been done, um, but I was born in Poughkeepsie, New York um, in 1989, so I'm 28. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, and yeah, I'm second generation Lao and Vietnamese, so my parents um, resettled in the U.S., and I was the first 
born. Um, I come from a working class family. Both my parents work in manufacturing. Um, yeah, I identify as queer and an only child. Um, and I really want to bring out those identities because I really think it helps me to really inform, like, how am I organizing around the Southeast Asian deportation work? Um, and like the nuances around like my culture identity as being Southeast Asian, queer, a male, only child, um, and kind of like those cultural expectations or responsibilities that came with that in response to organizing what is happening in our community now. Um, yeah, so kind of, yeah, I can go to the next slide. Yeah, so I kind of wanted to, again, do a little bit a framing, um, so 1975, have folks heard of, or what is, what is um, when you think of the year 1975, what is your reference point without looking at the slide? <laughs> <laughs> Just like one or two folks. So yeah, I think, right, um, as a Vietnamese person, and I'll go into it a little bit more later about my family's history, um, 1975 is a very important year. Um, April 30th, 1975 to be exact, was the fall of Saigon, as like a lot of us here in the US know of it. Um, but there's also, and that, that is kind of like the dominant narrative, right, of like folks who were escaping Vietnam when communism was coming to power out of the need for survival, right? So a lot of Southeast Asian families were coming, or Vietnamese families and individuals were escaping Vietnam out of the necessity to survive um, through refugee resettlement. Um, but the narrative that's sometimes often not talked about or heard is it's also referred to as Liberation Day, right? Um, do folks wanna take a fly? Yeah, yeah, so that's kind of the other piece of it. It's, also, it's known as Fall of Saigon or Liberation Day. And um, Liberation Day, a lot of folks also know it by that in the way that kind of what you were sharing is that, yeah, Vietnamese nationals, right? This was kind of the first time where Vietnam was not being um, dominated or controlled by a foreign um, country or a foreign force, right? Um, there's been like thousands and thousands and thousands of years of like colonization um, and imperialism within Vietnam, whether it was like being controlled and governed by like the Chinese, the French, the Japanese, the US, the French, right? And so a lot of this kind of was a moment where Vietnam was able to um, have the sense of like united front and like um, self-governance and agency to really um, identify for itself what does it want, what does Vietnam want to be as a nation, right? For, for its own, our, for its own people and our own people. Um, so yeah, if you go to the next. So yeah, you can keep going. Yeah. So right, so we see, I just wanted to show two different examples of like those experiences where, right, the fall of Saigon, my dad was from southern Vietnam and he escaped by boat, right? So we have that, I think when we think of, or when I think of 1975, I think very much so about my dad's experience of having to escape the country out of need of survival and he escaped by boat, right? Um, but the other piece of it is thinking about, right, like it was also a way, this other narrative of Vietnamese folks who are really um, pushing back against foreign invasion and really fighting for self-autonomy and self-agency to govern um, ourselves and our own people, right? Um, so I think this is really important because it's kind of not an either or, but it's actually how do we hold both of these narratives and the organizing work that we're doing, especially when it comes to Southeast Asian deportation, working with families who came here um, as refugees because communism was coming to power in Vietnam and Southeast Asia, um, who are about who are getting deported back to that country, right? Um, so yeah. Um, yeah, so I just kind of again wanted to 
uh, again, a little bit of context, and some of y'all might be familiar about with this already, but kind of doing a snapshot of Southeast Asian war history and policies, which really helped to paint a picture about what is happening now around Southeast Asian deportation. Um, so 1954 was a really important year because it was also um, the Battle of Dien Bien Phu. Uh, it was the year that the French lost um, that battle to Vietnam, but that was also the year that the US started to become involved in the Vietnam War. Um, also known as the American War, and I often refer to it as the war in Southeast Asia. Um, and I just call it the American War because it, wasn't, it was a war that Vietnam was not asking to be involved in. It was a war that the U.S. came into the country and started that war and created a conflict right, between the Northern and Southern Vietnam. Um, but I also talk about it as a war in Southeast Asia because it impacted not just Vietnamese folks, but it impacted like Brought, like surrounding countries. So when I talk about Southeast Asia in the political context, I'm talking about Vietnamese folks, Lao folks, Hmong folks, Cambodian folks, right? Um, and so that is why I refer to it as the war in Southeast Asia because these were countries that were surrounding Vietnam who are impacted and also came to the US um, as refugees because of the war. Yeah. Um, so the other piece I really wanted to share was in 1967, um, there was a speech that was delivered by Martin Luther King Jr. Um, that was about beyond Vietnam. And so we, I, to be honest, like I, this history, I didn't even know about it like until like seven years ago, right? And I think a part of it is like, it's not taught in like regular, like elementary school, middle school, high school about my people and my community. And so this was really important for me to really share with y'all because this speech was the first like anti-war public speech that Martin Luther King Jr. made about like the war that was happening in Vietnam. Um, and it was also really happening during the civil rights movement, right? And so I think the nuances of, he talked about like what does it mean for the solidarity and us to be in solidarity with each other in the fight for liberation but also like really um, being critical about the US government and when the civil rights movement is happening and racism and discrimination is happening in our own country and yet we're, and to black and brown communities specifically and we're sending them to, the, to another country to fight in a war um, to protect our people, right? And so I think it's those nuances that I just like continue to think about and what, how does that inform our organizing work even today? Um, as we're like, as like we're, I'm organizing around Southeast Asian deportation, how does that connect to like the broader issue of immigration and deportation issues, knowing that it impacts other communities as well? Yeah. Um, so yeah, 1975, again, um, fall of Saigon, Liberation Day. Um, and it was also, I mean, coming up this month is, it's also known as Black April. Um, and so there's usually a like commemoration and a day of remembrance for like that year and that day specifically um, within the Southeast Asian Vietnamese community um, for like folks who had to flee and like the lives lost, but also, yeah. Um, so 1980 was um, the Refugee Resettlement Act uh, where essentially there was funding, temporary funding that was given to um, Southeast Asia, or like allocated to help with the refugee resettlement process to the US. Um, and it was, sorry, notes. Um, yeah, and so in, this was a process for like, after the fall of Saigon a few years later for, to be able to have Southeast Asian folks and refugees come to the US and it increase the amount of funding as a way to bring more Southeast Asian folks to the US. Um, and then, yeah, so the next few are gonna be kind of like the different policies that have really, and I think, help again to paint a picture about what is happening around the deportation in Southeast Asian communities. So the next few slides are gonna be like around the 1990s, but so 1994 was the Violent Crime Control and Law Enforcement Act. So essentially what it was, it was, a largest, it was the largest crime bill in the history of the US. 
Um, and essentially, it just allocated billions, $9.7 billion in funding for prisons and $6.1 billion in funding for prevention programs, right? Um, so they were allocating a massive amount of money for the, the development of more prisons in the US. Um, and after that, in 1995, um, there was the Personal Responsibility and Work Opportunity Reconciliation Act. And essentially what that was, um, to keep it simple, is that it actually made it harder for like, communities, especially communities of color, to actually be able to apply and receive like, funding, financial assistance, um, and welfare. And things like that. And then 1996, was the Illegal Immigration Reform and Immigrant Responsibility Act. Um, it's also known as IRA. Um, and this is kind of one of the key policies that I, I continue to go back to and see how it's really impacting Southeast Asian communities now. Um, essentially, this act in 1996 um, made it so that the definition of what an aggravated felony was, was broadened. Um, so the definition of what was considered aggravated felony was brought in, and that could become a deportable offense. Um, and it also made it retroactive, right? So that meant that like, folks who had committed their crime, served their time, um, though, because it was now made retroactive, even though like, Southeast Asian communities are like folks who have like, committed those crimes and served it, and years down the line, they might have started families, they might have um, kind of like changed their lives around and started working and like started to have some sort of stability in the US, they were now uh, eligible or at risk for deportation. Um, and that is what we're seeing right now in the Southeast Asian community, which we'll sh I'll share more. Um, oh no, there was one more. Oh no, it's okay. <laughs> So, oh, it's okay. <laughs> um, so yeah, in 2002, um, I don't know if folks know, but 2002, there was the Cambodian Repatriation Agreement. Um, so essentially what this was, it was an agreement that was signed between the US and Cambodia that um, stated that Cambodia was now going to accept Cambodian nationals in the US back to that country. And so, yeah, so that was signed in 2002. And what we saw after that was that there was a rise in detention and deportations within the Cambodian community, um, especially 2001, 2002, um, when that started happening. Yeah. Uh, actually, can you go back quickly? And so I think, yeah, one of the other pieces I think we wanna just think about is like, if we look at it as like, entire like overall broad picture, right? Thinking about, okay, 1954, like the US like came to Southeast Asia and invaded the country and got involved. And that really caused like, um, essentially like the falls like on Liberation Day and refugee resettlement in the 1980s, right? Um, and I think for me, what hit me the hardest when I'm thinking about it is like, okay, like um, Southeast Asian communities and families and individuals are coming to the US for fear out of, for need of survival um, through the US. And as they're, as they're like going through a lot of these challenges and a lot of like trauma that they're seeing while they're living in Southeast Asia during the war, they're coming into a country where like maybe 10 years or five years um, later, depending on when they resettle to the US, all these policies are being enacted in the 90s that are specifically targeting like black and brown communities, but that because of the resettlement, Southeast Asian communities were also impacted by that, right? And so I think for me, that was really important to think about as well as like, right, like these policies were still, a, were a direct attack on black and brown communities during this time, but that Southeast Asian folks, because of the refugee resettlement process and when, were also the ones who were impacted by it, maybe indirectly, but, and not targeted, but still impacted. Um, and so I think a part of it is just thinking about like, uh, what does it mean, again, to be in solidarity and stand with other communities who are 
organizing around different issues like racial profiling, police brutality, and how do we see it connected to root causes of the oppression that all of us are facing. Um, so yeah. Uh, yeah, so I'm gonna share a little bit more personal stuff with y'all um, about my family. Because um, I think it's really important. I think this is just one story of like many stories. Um, but I think I wanted to share this because I think it'll help again to paint a better picture. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so my dad, my, na my dad's name is Niu Lam. Uh, and this is a picture of him. He's in the blue tank top. It's kind of small, sorry. Um, but he's in, a, in the blue tank top and that's, and my mom's on the left um, with um, his parents and two of his siblings. Uh, my dad is one of 10 siblings. Um, and yeah, this is it, the first time that, or the first time that I was able to go back to Vietnam when I was five years old in 1996. Uh, my dad left Vietnam in 1980 when he was 18. Um, so if we think about it, he was like a child during the war and he had to leave um, in 1980 when he was 18 years old. Um, and the reason why it was five years later is because he didn't know, or him and the family did not know how bad it was gonna be um, upon like, the, after the fall of Saigon or Liberation Day. Um, and so, yeah, I think, so some background, my dad would share stories about to me and he, him and the family, uh, my dad's side of the family grew up in the countryside um, about an hour south of Gunta, which is like five hours south, um, south of Saigon. Um, and yeah, he grew up poor, uh, came, came from a family of farmers. Um, and so a part of it also is like, I wanted to bring that class piece into it because with refugee resettlement, the ways in which like folks got to leave the country were also different. There was about like, there's like the first wave where it was like folks who were connected to like the government and elected officials um, and had some type of status and class were able to leave first, sometimes even before the fall of Saigon happened. Um, and the second wave and third, second wave of refugees were folks who were where my dad was, like boat people, like folks who were fleeing the country in boats um, and then from there staying in refugee camps um, before coming to the US. And then there's like a third wave, which is like a broader Southeast Asia and refugee resettlement process. Um, yeah. yeah, so these are just some pictures of, I th of me and actually like just family um, going, or me visiting for the first time. Um, and I was five, six years old at that time. Uh, and then the second time is actually when I went back, so the first time was when I was five or six, the second time was when I was 19. Um, and also, my dad was the only one, um, in addition to like one brother and his nephew, out of 10, out of 10, right, siblings who ended up coming to the US. So it's also seeing how like US imperialism has also like ripped families apart um, because there was also a lack of the ability to actually have everyone come together or because of safety reasons, right? Um, yeah. And then this is just another photo of my dad, myself, and two of, and my grandparents um, in Vietnam. And I think, again, this is really important because I think as I'm doing this deportation work and as ARW is organizing with Southeast Asian communities, I think part of it is connecting it to the work, to like our actual like histories and like our family's histories about like what does it bring up for us as we're trying to organize in the Southeast Asian community um, that has faced so much like trauma around the war and knowing that like families have been broken apart and families have been ripped apart um, and knowing that actually my dad does not get the ability to communicate or see his grand or see his parents um, Right, like in many, many, many years. Um, and this, this was the last photo that we took together before both of my grandparents ended up passing away, um, which was pretty recent, so yeah. Um, and then, 
yeah, again, just uh, another photo of like, I try to find a photo with everyone um, just to really highlight, like, right, like this family unity and community that is there for um, where my dad is coming from. But I think it was just really hard. But one of the things that also stood out is like when he went back, it was a way for him to also reunite or reconnect with like some of his high school friends who he hasn't seen in like 40 years. Um, and then I put a photo of just me and like kind of getting my master's degree. Um, I think a part of it, when I introduced myself about like being from a working class family, being an only child, I think this was really important for me to think about is like, right, like that dream that my family had for me about what does it mean for us to be able to give you um, the opportunities that we weren't able to have because of the war. Um, and to leave everything that we knew to try and give you a better life is kind of how they've always put it. Um, and so for me, this was also, I think, a success moment, but not just for me. The way I saw it is like, as I was walking the stage or receiving my degree, it was actually for my parents um, as well, because they, weren't, they were never able to finish high school or go to college. Um, and so this was um, a really powerful and reflective moment for me, and also the work that I do. So next is um, my mom, which, um, and her name is Pillai. Uh, her middle name is O, but um, her loud, or like what it was is Ogdragoon and Lam. Um, so I do both because I think it's just different in terms of me being Vietnamese and Lao. I think those experiences look very differently and the way I think about Southeast Asian organizing and the work that we're doing around this work. Um, there's, it just feels different or looks different. And I, yeah, I think of it as like myself as a Lao person and a Vietnamese person, how do those connect within this broader umbrella of Southeast Asian identity and being able to hold not just my Viet identity, but my Lao identity, but also thinking about Hmong folks and Cambodian folks under this larger political um, context of being Southeast Asian. So, yeah, so my mom left Laos in the mid 1980s. Um, and this was really important to know because um, when we talked about the fall of Saigon, I think, and I referred to it as the American War or the war in Southeast Asia, um, my mom left in the mid 1980s from Laos. Um, and she is, she's like 60, 61. Um, and so she was a little bit older than my dad when the war was happening. Um, and sh the war in Laos, first of all, Laos was a neutral country um, at, during the time of that. So I don't know if folks know about, um, it's called the secret war in Laos. Folks know. Yeah. Oh, yeah, so essentially the reason why it's called a secret war in Laos is because it was a war that I think Nixon, or the president, the US president at the time had issued um, to have um, bombs, basic bombing of Laos, to have to order like an operation to begin bombing on surrounding countries um, that were in Vietnam. And the reason was because the Mekong River, which extended from the north to the south of Vietnam, was used as a way for resources to be traveled and also for folks to travel. So. Um, because of that, Laos and Cambodia, which were neutral countries at the time, were also bombed. Um, and Laos was one of the most um, bombed countries. Um, and a way to describe it is like, or think about it is like two million tons of ordnance were dropped on the country, uh, which is 580,000 bombing missions, which equaled a plane load every eight minutes, 24 hours a day for nine years. Um, and so, at, for my mom, she would share with me stories about um, having to, like, waking up to the sound of bombs, listening to bombs, and also, um, yeah, going, and because of the, where she grew up in Hoi Sai, which is in a village um, near the Mekong River, when she went to the river, she would actually see bodies um, in the river. And to this day, there are still unexploded landmines. Um, that are in Laos, right? And a lot of folks in Laos make their um, living through like farming and agriculture and gardening. And so thinking about how that war is still really 
um, prevalent in even the country today um, where folks are trying to make a living, but these unexploded mines during the war are still there, right? And folks are getting hurt from it now. Um, yeah, so the way that my mom grew up was a little bit different than my dad, where she did come from a family that had a little bit more of like wealth and class and like had um, housemaids and folks like that who like took care of her and the family. She grew up in a family of 11. Um, and so, yeah, they, um, her parents ran a local business that all the children had helped out with. Um, and yeah, I think she, she did not have the opportunity to go to school um, or travel to the city to like um, get an education. And so she ended up staying in the countryside to support like the family business. Um, and so when communism started coming to power in Laos, um, the family decided to make their escape to Thailand. Um, and so at that time, she was split up from the rest of her family. Um, she went with her, one of her siblings who was pregnant um, and another sibling who had a baby at the time, a, young, a newborn baby. And so the way to cross to Thailand is you have to cross the Mekong River. Um, and so for her to escape, she had to, she had to try it twice because the first time they had to turn around because they couldn't make it um, because of um, police control and like around the Thai Thailand border and that if you were caught, you probably wouldn't live or survive. Um, so the second time they were able to cross um, and reunite with the family and then from there they stayed in the refugee camp for two years um, in Thailand. And I think the reason they could have escaped or like left the camp earlier um, and come to the US, but the reason why they stayed in the refugee camp longer is because the, my mom's family wanted to stay together and that they knew that if they left earlier or decided to split off, they might never see each other again. Um, and so part of it was they were um, going to stay together and wait for um, a Catholic family to sponsor them to come to the US as a whole unit. Um, and so that's kind of how I ended up in Poughkeepsie, New York. Uh, <laughs> and I think just in terms of like refugee camp and conditions, what ended up happening is um, my grandfather on my mom's side passed away during the camp. Um, and a lot of that was due to stress, due to um, anxiety, due to, and picking up like smoking more and um, drinking, which I think was also just a reflection of the conditions of the refugee camp and what he had to go through or the family had to go through. Um, so my mom and her 10 siblings and um, my grandmother came to the US. Um, yeah, and so after we, re are you can go up here. Yeah, so that's my mom now. Um, and on the left, she's the younger girl on the, um, on the right. And then that's her younger sibling uh, her younger brother, and then um, the woman who's like in the middle holding the bottom is um, her older sister. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and so I think a part of the refugee resettlement process was in Poughkeepsie, New York. I don't know if folks are familiar with that, um, but there's actually no Southeast Asian community. Um, growing up there, I was one out of five Asians. Um, the other three were my cousins from kindergarten through 12th grade um, and another family. Um, and so that refugee resettlement process was a way that like, right, like Southeast Asian communities were, and families were just placed in different pockets all over the US. Um, and so my family ended up being um, placed in Poughkeepsie where there was no like culturally competent or adequate resources for Southeast Asian communities um, for like readjusting and like stabilizing their lives in the US after having lost everything um, from the war and having to leave everything and everyone. Um, and so I think for us, a part of that process and having no community there, my mom really continues to try and like hold on to the sense of culture and her Lao culture um, through attending like temples and will travel like two, three hours away just to go to a Lao temple, right? Because that was her only outlet to be able to connect to the community. Um, and that was reflective of my experience where it took me 21 years 
um, to even connect to Southeast Asian communities beyond just my family through some of the organizing work that I've done with um, the Province Youth Student Movement in Providence. Um, and then I think the bottom is just, yeah, I think I just wanted to show it because my mom's side of the family is really big. This isn't everyone. Um, and my mom's family, this was at a recent wedding, but comes from a family of, I think if you count everyone, like nephews, nieces, siblings, it's probably like 70 to 100 folks. Um, and I think that's really important around, I think growing up, I, there was always a sense of like collectiveness and like community um, because family didn't have each other, right? Or like the family, all we had was each other and we didn't have anyone else or any other can you could turn to. And so that family union or like community and collectiveness was something that has been carried out from like from the time I was born to now. And so that was just a reminder of that moment of like, right, like no matter what or like where we are in our lives, that collectiveness is always still there. So yeah. Um, yeah, so that's kind of like a snapshot of like the policy, my personal history, and then I wanted to turn it and shift into kind of the organizing and what folks have been doing in response to Southeast Asian deportations, right? Um, so this, I don't know if folks have seen it, but is a, um, is a documentary web series on YouTube that was done by NBC Asian America by Sarah Van Nguyen, um, who documented the um, organizing efforts of the Southeast Asian Freedom Network, which is a group of local community groups, organizations, organizing against Cambodian deportations that were happening at the time. Um, so yeah, there's five parts. You can watch it on YouTube, but this is the fifth part, because um, I will help, yeah. So yeah, I just wanted to paint, or like show you that, because I think it really helps to depict what has happened within the last um, one to two years um, after so the Southeast Asian Freedom Network went to Cambodia to try and um, address the repatriation agreement. Um, so yeah, I think the next part is um, to share again what is happening now, right? Um, so a lot of what we've been seeing within Southeast Asian deportation over the past few years has been specifically impacting like Cambodian communities in, across the US. Um, and so when 2002, when the repatriation agreement was signed in Cambodia, a few years later, in 2008, the Vietnamese re, uh, repatriation agreement between the US and Vietnam was signed. Um, pretty much saying the same thing where Vietnamese nationals living in the US were now deportable back to Vietnam. Um, the difference with those two agreements was that Cambodia's agreement included everyone, um, like anyone was deportable um, as a Cambodian national living in the US with those like criminal convictions and having already served their time. But with the difference with that is that the Vietnamese repatriation agreement created a set of criteria that stated that these were folks who were at risk of deportation and these are the folks who are to be excluded from deportation in the Vietnamese community. A part of that was, and so one of those pieces was um, if um, folks who are living in the US um, who are Vietnamese had lived in a third country other than Vietnam. So oftentimes it's also known, if we think about it, as like the 1.5 generation, where as communities are like fleeing um, from Vietnam, some of like the children were born in refugee camps in Thailand or in the Philippines, right? And coming to the US, so a lot of it is like, the folks who are potentially at risk for deportation have never been to Vietnam, might not speak the language, might not have family there, right? And so there's also a cause for like, how can you deport us to a country we've never been to? Um, another criteria that um, was to protect like some folks from the Vietnamese community around uh, humanitarian issues and if there were safety concerns for Vietnamese folks living in the US um, being deported back to Vietnam, if it was a safety risk or concern, um, for their life um, and things like that. Um, and the third one, which is pretty significant, is that vi the Vietnamese folks who came to the US before July 12th, 1995, were supposed to be excluded from deportation. A part of that is because of, that was when the US reopened um, re the relationship between Vietnam and the US. Um, and that was also after like 
a lot of the refugee resettlement or being classified as a refugee coming to the US. So Vietnamese folks who came before 95 were supposed to be protected. Um, and so that was what the agreement stated and had. But at what we started to see in 2017 because of this agreement as well, so within the last year, is that there was an increase in detention and deportations in the Southeast Asian community. Um, so just a snapshot of the past like six, seven months of what's been happening is that in April 2017, nearly 100 Vietnamese community members were detained in York County Detention Center in New York and Chrome Detention Center in Florida. Um, and this was uh, 100 Vietnamese folks like basically raided nationwide and then deport or detained in those two facilities. Um, and then in August, after hearing what was happening in April, the response was that community organizers and groups came together, um, specific, specifically Vietnamese organizers and community groups came together who are working in the community um, to form a network similar to what was the Southeast Asian Freedom Network that was mobilizing and organizing against Cambodian deportation to fight specifically against Vietnamese deportation. Um, so we refer to ourselves as BB Fam which is like base building family. Um, part of it, we're still coming up with the name, but it's also um, referred to as like the Viet Anti-Deportation Network, right? And it made up of um, six organizations. So the Asian American Resource Workshop here in Boston, um, the Southeast Asian Coalition in North Carolina, uh, Viet Unity, which has um, two chapters that are involved, Viet Unity East Bay and Viet Unity South Bay, um, Viet Lead in Philadelphia, Mekong, New York City in the Bronx, and Asian Pacific Islander Reentry of Orange County, um, also known as API Rock. So these six organizations and groups came together to respond to what was happening um, in, in the Vietnamese community and the detention and deportation that was taking place within the year. Um, yeah, and so after um, these organizations formed to become the BB Fam Network, in some September 2017, um, there were more ICE raids that took place in the Vietnamese community, and community members were, again, detained, um, but this time in Georgia, um, in two detention centers that were in Georgia. And when we heard about that, one of the first things that we did as a network was to put out a community alert. Um, nationwide um, to let folks know what was happening. And um, part of it was for folks to have know your rights materials and know like this is what's happening in our community because people weren't talking about it and people didn't know. Um, and so we put out a community alert in English and Vietnamese as a way to give a notice and a heads up to Vietnamese community members and the folks that we're working with around, yeah, our community uh, is getting like detained and deported right now. Um, and so after those alerts came out, what some of the folks in the network did was actually go to Georgia to visit the detention centers and visit the impacted folks and detainees as well as try to support families um, during this increase in ICE raids in the community. Um, and the other thing is like once we put out that community alert, a lot of like our own local groups started getting more calls and like more like contact about like folks who are either worried about being detained and deported, um, worried for their families, and or, and or we're just looking for support uh, and resources of where can they go if something like this happens. And so when ARW and Dot I, which is the Dorchester Organizing Training Initiative, when we put out the community alert in Boston, uh, folks started to hear about what was happening, and that was when we made. Um, initial contact with one of the families that we were working with in the Boston area. And so this is a picture of the family. Um, and so some background is uh, the person who was deported is like, um, it's the Le and Sparks family. Uh, and Yan Le was deported um, on November 20th of last year, uh, a few days right before Thanksgiving. And so what happened and a little bit of background with her story is she came to the US in 2009 um, and was arrested and convicted of a crime in 2013 
ser served, or no, 2012, 2013, and then served six months of time and was let out early. Um, and since then, she was working a stable job, working to raise her children, working to support her family, and living a stable life with her, her partner, and her children in Dorchester. Um, and what happened this past year is at a regular ICE check-in visit, um, after that, she received a letter um, in the mail that was asking her to come in early. Um, and so in, on October 2nd, she went in for her check-in, and that was when she was detained um, on the spot. And so we made contact with her mid to late October, about two weeks before she was deported. Um, and we were trying to do everything that we could um, to support her and the family at in this very like critical moment and this, in this moment of crisis. Um, and since, so one of the main things that we did, and this being like one of the first families that we came into contact with, I think one was a really huge learning moment for us as an organization, as a group, of like, how do we build capacity uh, to organize and support families? And also, how do we really support families and like impacted individuals in the moment of crisis? when their families are getting, family members are getting detained or about to get deported, and how do, we have, how do we build our capacity in a way that we can actually move quicker than the process sometimes. Um, and the other thing that was really important in this situation was, right, this is a Vietnamese mother, right? And I think oftentimes, personally, when I hear about deportation, um, it's often seen as like, um, the priority is like the Southeast Asian men, or like men who are the only ones who are getting detained and deported, right? And so I think this was the first case that we, um, and first family that we were interacting with, where it was a Vietnamese woman, a mother, who was um, at risk for de deportation and did get deported, right? And so I think just um, thinking about like, how do we, hold space for like supporting like the women and the Southeast Asian women who are also getting um, detained and deported just as much so and putting our resources into that just as much as we are into supporting like Southeast Asian men who are also getting detained and deported. Um, yeah. And so, yeah, one of the things we did as a organization locally was to start a local fundraising campaign um, out of what the requests were from the um, the family and Yan herself, which was, I just want to make sure my family is okay. I just want to make sure that they are going to be safe, that they're going to be able to live, um, and that they still have a roof over their head and um, money, right? And so one of the immediate things expressed from both sides was um, just an urgency or need for money um, in order to restabilize after this was happening. Um, so we put a fundraising campaign together to raise $3,000 and we're able to exceed that, right? And so this is something that like, as like we're taking on and interacting and engaging with families and impacted folks, we're trying to, learning as we go and trying to build our capacity in the areas that we know we have ability to support in. Yeah, um, yeah so, since October, um, what ended up happening is there was a lot more increase in like folks again calling like community hotlines, call, reaching out to local organizations. And in February 2018, um, there was a national Southeast Asian deportation convening um, in DC. And this was really a historical moment because a lot of folks shared and felt that this was actually the first time that the Southeast Asian community was coming together to really think about how do we coordinate and build out a national Southeast Asian strategy to address issues impacting our communities, right? Specifically around deportation. Um, and so this included the folks from the Southeast Asian Freedom Network, um, which was organizing around Cambodian deportation, um, the Southeast Asian Resource Action Center, which is a national policy organization working with Southeast Asian communities and groups, and then the BB Fam crew, right? And that also, and in addition to that, included like impacted individuals, family members. Um, and because of that, something that we really want to emphasize is like our organizing and our strategy really needs to be informed by those who are most impacted. Um, and that we should not be coming up with a strategy without the folks who are actually being directly impacted from the issues themselves. 
Um, and so from that convening, it was coming together to connect and build and also think through what, what would a national Southeast Asian strategy look like to fight against deportation. Um, and then in March 2018, the following month, um, the Vietnamese community ended up filing a class action lawsuit against ICE. Um, so what, what we ended up finding out was that with the repatriation agreement that stated that folks who came before 1995 were supposed to be excluded or protected from deportation, we ended up finding out that about 40 plus Vietnamese folks were getting, who came before 1995 were getting detained um, and were in prolonged and unjust detention for longer than they should be um, without a travel date or any um, idea of if they were gonna be deported or not. So in this moment of like limbo. Um, and then as of this, this month, in April 2018, there was a Joint Freedom of Information Act that was submitted to ICE um, for deportation and detention information across all, about all Southeast Asian communities across the country that was signed by 70 organizations. So part of that was a way to have ICE share with us, like who are you detaining and what is that information? Because we need to know, um, one, are you actually adhering to like the agreements that were signed, um, the repatriation agreements, and two, like how long have folks been in detention um, and really trying to figure out how to, can we support the folks who are there and also families. Um, and so these are some of the efforts that we've been doing and we've been brainstorming and mobilizing around as a national Southeast Asian collective and network. Um, but yet we still, and to this month, we still see an increase in detentions and deportations across the Southeast Asian community. And as of a week ago on April 4th, um, 43 Cambodian folks, which has been the most um, that have been detained and deported in a year, or in one like plane and of deportation, um, have been deported back to Cambodia. Um, and that was the largest single deportation ever that's happened as of today. Yeah, and so I think, yeah, so I think as it is right now, right, I think when we put out those community alerts, when like the news and the media is starting to show visibility about what is happening around Southeast Asian deportation, and especially in this, I think, political moment and climate, a lot of folks are wanting to support and engage. Um, and so we want to share like the different ways to support different organizing efforts, right? Um, one is to get involved with a local community organization. Um, it's something that we've really identified as like, in order to like really support these folks, like how can you connect with these organizations um, that are doing the work as a way to build capacity? Um, the other piece that we identified locally is um, support with the Vietnamese interpretation and translation is like one of the biggest things that we've identified locally is a huge necessity for us to be able to organize and do this work. Um, I think, right, a lot of the folks who are organizing are also like 1.5 or second generation Southeast Asian folks who might not have the language capacity to communicate with the folks who are being detained because they might have come during a different generation or, um, or were refugees and don't have um, English proficiency. And so one of the things that we identified is like, if you have the capacity to support with Vietnamese interpretation or translation to do intake to communicate with impacted folks or family members, that is something that we identified. Um, the other pieces, um, the next three are part of the National Southeast Asian strategy that we're building out. One is around like supporting with base building efforts. So it's like continuing to do know your rights trainings and education. Um, if folks are interested and have capacity and availability to actually do some case management and or family support, which means like working and building relationships and connections with the families and identifying what are the things that families need support in and how can we collectively support that family. Um, the other piece is around supporting with media and communications, um, which included like prepping like family members or impacted folks um, with getting ready to talk with, to, with or to media, for, um, some of them for the very first time. Um, thinking through how are we talking about Southeast Asian deportation and the impact on the community. 
um, and also documenting, documenting like what is happening um, when there are ice raids, the organizing efforts, things like that. Um, and then the other biggest piece too, that's part of the National Southeast Asia Strategy, is supporting with like the legal aspect, the legal piece of it. We know that community organizing can support and organize and fight against um, deportation, but we know that that is not the only way and that is, can't be the only way that we're gonna end deportation and that actually um, an immediate need is like, how do we connect impacted folks, detainees, to the legal resources and legal support that they need to actually get a confident, culturally confident uh, immigration lawyer that will actually take on their case and provide the legal support where it's needed. Um, and a part of that is also um, like the class action lawsuit that was done within the Vietnamese community um, and following up on the next steps around like what needs to happen for that and supporting around the action steps for that class action lawsuit. Um, and the other piece was creating a national database. So part of it was also identifying like the resources, but also identifying like who, who and where are, like folks in the Southeast Asian community are getting detained, deported, right? Um, and then the last like very concrete way to actually um, support is to do a phone bank to Governor Brown in California in Orange County um, for a pardon for a tongue win. Uh, so I don't know if y'all know him, but Tung is actually an impacted person um, based in Orange County um, who served 16 years as um, in prison. And since then, he's also the person who organized, the main organizer with Asian API Rock. Um, so one of the actual organizations that are part of the Vietnamese anti-deportation network. Um, and so he came to the US as a young person got caught up in a crime, served his time, served 16 years, um, and since then has um, st ha started a family, has really committed his life to community organizing, to fighting against deportation, and working with previously and currently incarcerated folks within the Southeast Asian community to support them, and really thinking about criminal justice reform. And so what this pardon would actually do is, and, um, vacate almost um, the, de his deportation proceedings. So it would actually make him um, protected from deportation um, and not have to live in the state of limbo where he never knows, like, the next time he goes in, will he be deported and ripped away from his family and children? Um, and so what I have here are scripts, um, or like flyers, which actually like give more information about who he is as well as like um, the numbers that you can call and if you're not sure what to say, scripts of um, what you can say and talking points in order to um, phone bank in support of Tung Nguyen for the governor's pardon. Um, so we don't have to do that right now, um, <laughs> but I would, it would be really helpful if folks um, take one, take two, take as many as you think, um, depending on who you think will make those calls in support of Tung. Um, because this is one of the ways that we're actually trying to fight against deportation is like also fighting for folks individually in their cases. Um, yeah, and I think, I think that's it, but I guess the only other thing that I want to say is like within the Southeast Asian community, we know Cambodian deportation has been happening. We see Vietnamese deportation is happening. And part of it is like, if we're thinking about the Southeast Asian political context, um, preparing and anticipating for if and when there will be Lao and Hmong deportation, detentions and deportations coming up, right? I think it's, so it's a way of like, through all these organizing efforts that have been happening within the Southeast Asian community, um, how can we build on those and really think about how we can prepare more proactively for like, the rest of the Southeast Asian community and Lao and Hmong communities who are potentially at risk for deportation down the line. Um, and yeah, I think the only two other things I think I really want to share is, right, my parents have been in the US for 40 plus years. Um, and they've never felt like they've been heard in the US. They felt like their issues were never cared about in the US. And so I think this has been a moment where 
we're actually able to really engage with our families and, um, or personally, for me to engage with my family and for me to like have them understand the work that I'm doing, but also pull them into the work and really understand, like, right, like, our families are here because the U.S. was in our homes, right? And that now, once our communities and our families are here, we're now at risk to go back to these countries that we had to flee from in the first place. In the first place. So like the Secret War in Laos, the Khmer Rouge in Cambodia, the Vietnam War, right? And so thinking about that, and I think, yeah, and just, so I think for me, it's like a way to connect to our families and also like engage them in this work and seeing it again as like a community effort. Um, and I think this idea of like organizing and what does that mean, I think the last thing is just around, right? Like my family like came to the US or our Southeast Asian communities came to the US out of the need to survive and we're never really thriving, right? Where Southeast Asian communities have only been in the US for about 40 years. And as we're still building out that infrastructure, how do we build out our capacity to really mobilize and organize in a very effective way where we're not burning out, right? And not working out of crisis. And so I think for Southeast Asian communities, they've been organizing before this idea of like organizing came to be. Uh, right, like organizing families and friends and communities and neighbors to escape these countries and flee these countries to come to the US and now, right, and so I think organizing is innate within the Southeast Asian community and that's how I see it, right? And there's a resilience of like, if we were able to do that, we'll actually be able to organize here too. Um, and so I think I just want to end on that note is like, just like, yeah, those have been some of the key takeaways um, and actually, before folks leave, I have actually flip chart where um, you can sign up if you leave your name and contact information to um, put your name where you feel like you want to support um, some de deportation organizing efforts, and we can follow up with folks later. But I also want to leave time for Q and A. Oh. Yeah, we can do that too. Yeah, so I think that's it. And I guess if folks have Q and A. Yeah, thank you so much, Kevin, for that powerful presentation. I learned a lot. So if anyone has a question, raise your hand, and I will bring you the microphone so that everyone can hear you and people on the live stream can hear you as well. So I just wanted to ask for clarification about the um, Cambodian people who are deported, the big deportation, and how that relates to what was shared in the video. Um, like, did that, what happened in the video, is that like an ongoing thing to try to prevent that kind of deportation or? What? Yeah, so the Southeast Asian Freedom Network um, is an ongoing like organizing network of folks, local community groups, members, and in impacted individuals who are continuing to organize against uh, Cambodian deportation, um, right? And a part of their efforts was actually like One Love Cambodia was created to really support, right? Like what happens when folks who are being detained are actually deported back to that country to really establish some type of support structure for folks um, who are now deported. Um, and so, the video showed up to the end of 2017, um, but since then, there's still a lot of Cambodian, that we still see deportation in the Cambodian community happening. Um, and I think a part of that, where we saw where um, the Southeast Asian Freedom Network were trying to have the repatriation agreement adjusted or um, deportation to be paused, um, a lot of that has changed because of elections in Cambodia right now, too. I have a question. Um, so 
you mentioned that the black and um, Asian communities are often left out of the sort of national narrative around deportations. And I'm curious if you um, are aware of or participate in any efforts to um, sort of organize across lines of race and ethnicity with the Latinx community, black community, and Southeast Asian community. Yeah, so I think for me personally, I think, and th just through the work that we're doing around deportation at ARW, um, we're involved in spaces with like the Center to Support Immigrant Organizing, which is like folks coming together to address like what are all the different immigration deportation issues that are happening, right? And also around, so that includes like DACA and like Deferred Action Dreamers, right? And like TPS uh, for like Nepali folks and like other communities. Um, and so I think a part of it is like, yes. And then the other part is like, I think it's like a push and pull for us because there's actually no space to talk about Southeast Asian deportation that is happening. And while a lot of like the, to be honest, like the, in my opinion, the narrative or predominant narrative and like what's being seen is like DACA and Dreamers and TPS is like the main immigration deportation issue, right? And it is. And also there's, there's like deportation happening in our communities, right? In the Southeast Asian community. Um, and in Boston, I think especially, um, even now we're, I mean, to be honest, I think it's really hard because there's not enough folks with like language capacity to, to communicate and like actual immigration lawyers who are actually able to provide the legal assistance and legal support for the folks who are being impacted, right? Um, but I think a part of our organizing efforts is like right through like all these the Latinx and like black and brown communities that are organizing around immigration and deportation, a part of what we're thinking through is like what are the different resources and act, like ways that folks are like supporting um, doing and organizing around deportation that we can actually bring together, right? And how can those like resources be tailored or used or utilized in a way that can also support like Southeast Asian deportation organizing efforts as a way to support the community. So like thinking through, like right there are some folks who do accompaniments um, to like ICE check-ins or to immigration court. How can we use or like reach out and tap folks who are doing that versus like replicating it and actually adapting it or applying it to Southeast Asian anti-deportation organizing. Any more questions? Do we have any questions from online? Um, no, the only question we had that was maybe compared to that question from online was the whole question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll definitely, um, here, I'll stand in front of the camera. We will definitely be sharing um, a video of this talk as well as um, that you can send us links to include in a follow up email. Yeah. Um, and everyone who opted in, we can also share your email address with AARW so you can um, stay in touch with their organizing work. So again, uh, please join me in thanking Kevin Lamb. This has been an amazing talk. Thank you so much. Thank you.